Hi guys, uh, I'm gonna be showing some code on the screen. So if you like, there is a number of places over here you can move from the low, from the fire stand, go quite closer. There is a place. So if not, okay. So hi again. Uh, my name is Eugene Petrenko, and I'm gonna share my story about the sprint and how we can split the monolith. So the talk is called "Splitting Component Containers to Simplify Dependencies." So let me say a few words about myself first. So I'm PhD in computer science and doing Java Kotlin like almost all the working days. I do some small hacking in Go, C++, and other languages. I'm working for JetBrains. I'm doing, in the, I most of the time write in server-side applications, so using Spring and other technologies. And um, so I have a blog on, under this URL, so if you like, you can take a look at some pages. And so let's start. And um, this picture, so what I did, I took quite a small application, which is done with Spring framework, and decided to plot the diagram of the components, which we have inside, so this is a beans inside an application, and you are unlikely to understand anything out of this picture. So the lines between the dependencies, so, and the boxes, that be, means some components. And uh, actually, the problem is that there are so many components, but for not that huge application, and this one, 1.1K beans, so 1,000 beans, and uh, those are monoliths. So monolithic applications are looking this way, so it's quite Quite complicated. And there are uh, typical problems of such applications, and of course, people tend now to split it in microservices. And the problems are that there are a number of subsystems behind this picture, and each subsystem is able to communicate with the others. So, for example, if I say decide to find some executor service in this huge application, I'm likely to have some bean which implement this, and why not to use it? I can do this, and that may turn out into problems. Another problem is that each subsystem within this huge application tends to have its own dependencies, its own libraries. And this may be a problem for dependency hell because we may have in intersection in there. And finally, if we, are a if we put anything within one component container, we are likely to have unclear communication. It's so easy to break rules. It's so easy to depend on anything which is able there. And we may find out that there are some implementation detail being, and Somebody may decide to depend on this bean from the other part of application, and this can be unpredictable. This may work, but sometimes it may not. So I want to specify the problems which are able to be solved with the thing I'm going to explain. So the first one is non-trivial dependencies. Second one could be the weak bean isolation. So if we're trying to say, okay, this is my subsystem, those are my private beans, so private components, I'm not going to share it with anyone. I cannot do it easily now. And this may lead to a problem in the future. And then finally, that can be dependency hell. If I depend on library, somebody from the other component may depend on the other library. If, if I'm able to find the suitable dependencies and transitive dependencies, OK, but maybe not. So the, the problem, so I'm going to ask, uh, if it's OK to use to allow you, allow somebody to use implementation, so we must say yes or no. And if you say yes to me, I'm going to ask you, if it's OK to change the implementation details, so you may not be able to find this dependency clearly, but then if you say, if we turn back to this executor service example, if, if I decide to update this executor service to, to narrow the thread pool, will it work good if somebody is somewhere dependent on this executor service? Maybe not. Uh, if I decide to add new library to my program, will it work good? How many dependencies should I fix to make it finally start? How many dependencies should I fix to resolve it? And this can be tricky. And I'll throw back a little bit on this later. But uh, the problem I actually had was like this. So I had a huge library and I still use it. And there are a number of dependencies. So that library tend to depend like from anything. It depended from Jersey, Jackson, HK, Commons, and so on. And my problem was to be able to update this library frequently in my project. And I, it was clear to me, I'm not going to fix this dependency hell on and on again. And I'm going to explain how I was able to implement this. So my approach is to try to split the whole application we have into a, into a part. So we're going to split this huge comp component container into several small ones. And let's see how this can be implemented. 
So I decided to split the following talk into three logical parts. So we start from the most simplest thing. Then I show how it can be used. So the second one would be modules. And finally, I explain how this can lead to the class pass problem and dependency help. So let's start with the plugin context. So uh, under plugin, I would understand the following. So this is a logical part of my application. And this one uses some common APIs from my application and it uses the common component container. It's called, I'm gonna call it core. And the plugin itself is something that we can throw away. So this is an extensive extension part of our application. And of course we can understand the plugins like this can be internal part and external part. So if you're gonna let your users or you have some sort of API, you, you may introduce some API for plugin developers and explain them how they are able to provide their components into your application. And the second thing is internal. And when you're trying to split your existing application, you may consider a sort of API, sort of plugins, but those plugins are not intended to be used by anybody else from outside. Contrary, those plugins, those APIs are gonna be used inside our application and this is the tool to split dependencies, tool to just abstract and hide some part of implementations within the dedicated modules and parts. And we're gonna focus on this one next. So why actually the plugin in this definition is better and how it can solve? So the first thing, the plugin has its own application context in Spring, so it's able to create its own components inside and it isolates those components. So other parts of application are no longer able to outwire or depend on those components. Even if you try to call, say, get bin from a name, it would not work as well. And that's great. And this is a way to structure dependencies, actually. And that's that. Hey, I want the next slide. Oh, yeah. So the overall will look like this. So the boxes means application context. And we have, we're gonna have a number of contexts. So the core one, where we're supposed to have some major beans, major components. And for each plugin, we extract the container for every, every piece. And uh, the next question is how we are able to make this work. And it turns out that can be done in a several ways. And it depends actually on the way you like to create the components in Spring. So if you're still using, say, XML, you're gonna use a generic XML application context to start the plugin. If you use annotations, you may use annotation config. And in my examples, I'm gonna be using this one just to shorter the examples. Or you may have, I may use an idea to create in a context like a static context. The only trick to create the plugin is to pass the, par the current application context from a core as a parent into this context. That's it. So, it's quite easy. So if we have a number, in my case, packages, we can load plugins with a code like this. So, so I'm, I'm using Kotlin in my examples here, so it's just for each, so I hope it's, it's readable now. And the, the only trick is here that, that, that I pass a context.parent and that's that, that the whole trick. Then I call scan to scan packages and then I call refresh to make Spring to create my components with my plugin. And the second thing is at what moment one should call this code, actually. At what moment should I use my, load my plugins in my application? And frankly, it depends on application. In some examples, I'm gonna use this one, so I'm gonna use initializing bin, and I'm gonna use auto properties set. From the other hand, you may consider using some event or standard event from a Spring core, from the core, core context to initialize the plugin loading. It's up to, up to application, up to your likes and dislikes. And uh, now we're gonna, I'm gonna show this example with uh, IntelliJ and Kotlin. So in this example, we're gonna have uh, two plugins and a core and only a few lines of code to, to implement this. So my intent was to create as precise, as small example of this idea as possible. And uh, then we see how bin are actually isolated. So let me switch to IntelliJ. Is, is it visible now? Okay, so here I have my core part and the core service which is implemented over here. So I have a, a service which is able to print some part of Lorem Ipsum. And uh, I have uh, the I have the loader and the plugin loader code is, is exactly what I shown you while the presentation was. So it just iterates over the packages of plugins. 
And for every plugin, it simply creates the context and code refresh on it. And here I have one plugin, which have the components, which simply prints something in the output. And the second one, which depends on the core service, which is declared on the other Spring context. And then it is able to call this service over here. So if I now start this example with Gradle, uh, so it runs, and as we see from the output, we see that's from the very beginning. So we see here that the root context is created. This is output from Spring. Then the core components are loaded. Then it turns, it fires the event, and on this event, we start loading the plugins, and the first plugin is loaded, the components are executed, and here we see that the, the, the plugin one here called the, called the core service, so it's able to auto-wire this dependency and then it, it's executing, and finally it's time to start the second one, so it works this way. And now, as you see here from the plugin two, I have the component called plugin two, and say I, dis, I, I decided to have a dependency from plugin, as you see, plugin one, I decided to hug the thing, I decided to use dependency on plugin two. So maybe I am not aware of the context or the rules of the project, and I decided to hack things. So if I start this one, I'll see, I'll see an exception. And no matter if my project is set up, is created in one module, in one project, everything is mixed, but Spring, this configuration does not allow me to depend on the implementation details of the other plugins. And this is also my thing, because now we are able to isolate details. So and we can split our existing application into parts, into small parts, as long as we need this. And so now we're gonna turn back to the presentation. And uh, the thing is that once we reach this point, you may think, okay, cool, I'm, I'm able to load some extensions, but how my application is able to call these extensions and these plugins. And for this one, people tend to use uh, registry, extension registries, service locators, or event listeners. So every such a pattern where you're able to pass some instance to somewhere, and this somewhere can be available, say, in the core part, and then the, this core part is able to know that there is a plugin which implements something, some interface, and I can call it back. So, for example, I want to handle some web request, and I need to be able to pass the execution into a plugin code, so I need this sort of interaction between. And for this, we are likely to have something like this set of interfaces or similar. So we have some interface of our extension. And here I have no methods in this example for the sake of, for sake of simplicity. Or you may have a number of extensions which extend from some base class, like event listener pattern. And finally, you have a registry for such extensions, so we are able to register it and you have extension holder or something, or your event, listen, even, event multiplexer or something that is able to list those extensions and finally to call methods on top of that. And normally this likely that extension register and extension holder are implemented in the core, and then extensions are implemented everywhere in your application, and it may turn out that you have a number of different implementations, different hierarchies of this, or you may try to use generics to implement this, but ideally, it would look like this. So in the core context, the box on top, we have several components which implement this logic. And then in the plugin, we have another components which do actually implement extensions. And this is, every time it can be tricky. You may either decide to use some generics, use some libraries or something to implement those extensions, or you may decide to just create a parallel hierarchies for different purposes, because if you take a look on the real examples, you may see that the life cycles of such extensions can be way different. And it may be sometimes necessary just to create a different ways to register extensions of different kinds. Or maybe to use genetics and to have like extensions and get extensions from class from T on something like that. It depends on the project where you're trying to use it. Oh, here goes a small trick. Once we start doing these plugins, it may turn out that it's quite un unclear to figure out where this component is supposed to be implemented. Of course, you can do navigation in IntelliJ, like go to implementation to see the actual class, but it may be nice to have like annotations, custom annotations like I created for this example, like provided by core or provided by plugin. Those annotations means nothing to execution, but they may mean something to 
programmers who are trying to understand what's going on in there. So if you say def define this extension like provided by plugin, by reading this you can easily understand that this one is expected to be implemented somewhere in plugin. So I'm gonna go to check the plugin to see where implementations are. And when I start coding the, in the using this, I will understand that this one comes from somewhere and I maybe need uh, some extra euro checks or I need some, I cannot call it too early because plugins may not be ready for this moment and so on. And as for extension registration, this is yet another topic. Because here we have, this is an ideal thing, what, where, how extension can be implemented. Like, what I need, I need to implement an extension, I mark it as a component, and I expect it to be registered. By, but on practice, the reality may look like this. So we not only implement the, the extension, but we need to depend on this sort of registry or event listener or anything similar to finally say, hey, this is my extension, please register me in. And this is, and as, as you see here, this can be tricky because this is a way to register something that is not yet ready. For example, if this is a huge component, it may be lazily initialized by Spring, for example, and this is a risk to register something that is not ready and then to have some, ex some exceptions if we are lucky to reproduce them. And the other approach could be like this. So we may consider to create an yet additional component which does nothing but only depend from two, from the extension itself and from the registry, and then just register our extension within the registry. This can be do this way also, but there are benefits and problems out of this. Actually, the benefit of such explicit registration is dynamic. So you're able to say register not component, but something you create ad hoc in there in the implementation details, and you're able to do this. But from the other hand, it's quite easy to mess it because it's easy to forget. It may not be easy to understand what is getting actually registered in there. And if you, for example, decide to, you, to share it with a plugin developer from outside plugin developers, it can be even trickier to understand what they are going to pass in there. And uh, there is a probability, and I show that, to pass something that is not yet ready to work. And we need to have a stages within the loading to make sure our application is the first stage it's creating, then second stage it's initializing plugins, third stage it finally is able to work. It's not good, but maybe this is the way to go. And then finally we have a copy-paste pattern code, so we need to register every, every, every extension within an application and we need to repeat the same pattern on and on again. And then at some moment you may realize, okay, we need to change the API, we do registration, and that, that can be horrible if you're trying, for example, to not break any compatibility. And there is an alternative way, actually. And you may consider just calling the API from a context. So since we are able to load the plugins, we're able to call one more method from the component container and say, hey, please give me all extensions of this type I need. And then you can just pass those extensions within the registry within several lines in one, but in one place. And then all extensions which implement this extension interface or sub-interface are automatically registered. And this is really good, really easy and really good. And this is the way to have finally this example working. Um, so here goes yet another trick. If you use this approach or previous approach, no matter, you should never ever try to cache anything from your extension holder. So if you ask extension holder to give me extensions of some type, you should never cache it because it's likely you are executing this one in the middle of some outer initialization and that would mean you see the, the fewer, fewer components in there, not the whole list. And if you cache it, then you are likely to have a problems when the application is running and some components are not getting executed. And in this case, it's better to, if you need to cache it, it's really, it's really hard, it's tricky to not to cache it, but it's better to delegate the caching logic if you need some inside this extension holder implementation you have in your application. In that sense, the event listener may be better because it, it hides from the colleague that there is some list of subscribers who is going to have this notification being delivered. And so let me now to show you a demo. And this demo, we're gonna see this in action. And we're gonna see the component sharing. So, and the callbacks from the core. So I'm gonna switch to the next example over here. And let's just start it now. 
started now. So this is the, exactly the mostly the same project. I added only a few things, so I created this extension API. As, as it was shown on the slide, I created a trivial implementation of this extension holder interface, and I added this tiny piece of code like this to make extensions being registered automatically. And I updated this example to see here. I'm now, I'm now implementing this extension in the plugin one, and I implement an extension in plugin two this way. And I have a now, in the core part, I created yet another component called server. And this amazing component is able to, it tries to interact with extensions. So in my case, it simply prints out the classes we have. And as you see from the output now, so it's executing, doing pretty the same stuff as it used to be in the previous example. And at the end, it's able to show me the extensions from which are now available. So this is example shows how we can call extensions from their core component container. And in the real example, you're gonna have, you are likely to have more specific extensions with some meaningful methods to, for like to do some real, th real task in your application. So uh, questions at that point? Okay, so we turn back and now we are going to think a little bit more about the plugins. And the next logical step, if you're able to extract some functionality from your monolith as a plugin, you're likely to consider like, why not I able to create some extension points within the plugins? And of course, you are, like, you, you are able to do this. And if you're talking about the external plugins, it could play quite good. So like, some third party creates extension point, somebody else creates extension, something that extends this extension point and so on. But for internal applications, that can be quite tricky, and actually they implemented this thing and allowed to want to depend from plugin it can be quite tricky. And ideally, behind the curtains, we are thinking not about this one. It's this that we're like likely to have, but behind the curtains we like to have something like that. So we again we are expecting that we have the plugin API and plugin implementation because otherwise we we just creating the same monolith problem again for plugins, and that's not good. And so we are going to, actually we are thinking like how we are able to extract the plugin API, which, which plugin, for example, plugin two API, which plugin three is able to extend. And the same thing, we need plugin implementations. But if we take a look on this, and if we consider to implement this, all we need is just to have a composite application context inter class or interface, so that the, context, the application context, which is able to delegate for several sources as parent, and this is quite tough thing, because we need at least to, if we dare to implement this ourselves, uh, it's like 40 methods and six base interfaces, and if we are able to implement this, we are never likely to update Spring anymore, because uh, Spring is likely to change something in these interfaces and methods, and if we are implemented it ourselves, hopefully we are not uh, breaking contracts somewhere, but then we are unlikely to update this. It's, getting too complicated. The other approach could be to create sort of fake application context to put any dependent beans from all this plugin one, plugin two, and core within this fake context and pass this context as a parent. This is gonna work, but this again is quite complicated stuff. And if we take, consider class loading in this place, they're gonna be too complicated. And there is alternative way. If we are talking about the split in the monolith application we have, we are able to, think, why cannot we put this plugin API or in services and interfaces back into the core? If we are able to do this, we are turning back to this simple picture. But the only problem of this is to be able to make the plugin actually implement the component from the core. If we are able to do this, then we are able to simplify things. And we are able to avoid the plugin dependencies and replace it with components. And here goes a benefit actually. Because if we are able to do this, we no longer need to explicitly declare that the plugin three is dependent on plugin one and plugin two. Instead, the plugin three is expecting to have a components which are today implemented by plugins say one and two. And tomorrow they're gonna be plugin six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and whatever, which do implement the same service and we don't need to think and rewrite the plugin three to have this. And to implement this, this is the second part of our speech is about the modules. So I'm gonna have the yet another definition 
And under module, I understand a sort of specific plugin, which is able not only to use some components from a core, like a plugin, but it also able to, to declare that is providing beans back to the core context. And in that sense, this module is no longer optional, because if you're trying to register a component in a core, if we decide to throw it away from application, application is not going to start because it's not able to find the components. And the module itself is, is a powerful thing. If you are able to split your application, you can, do the, you can have modules, and this is the way to split subsystems out of the core part of your application. You're able to say, okay, my subsystem is like several interfaces, and those interfaces are implemented with module, and no other components from implementation details are even visible. Only those several interfaces are propagated back to the core. And I'm gonna explain how this can be implemented. So, first of all, we have, um, say, a service like this one, uh, which we are going to implement from a plugin. And this service is expected to be accessible from a core part of our application for a core context. And um, actually, how can we implement this? And it turns out that it can be implemented quite easily. All we need to use the bin factory. And in bin factory, our example over here, suppose that there is a base class that called plugin loader. It does the same thing as I showed before, like create an application context. But to extract a bin, we only need to have a bin annotated method, which specifies the type it returns. And it simply delegates to this created context to find this bin. That's so easy. The, the, here, here goes a trick. It's really, really necessary to specify explicit type of what you're going to return from this bin method. So it's necessary to say that it's service from the plugin in my case. So of course in Kotlin you may avoid, uh, omit it, but I decided to explicitly put it here because if you're not saying that this bin function, so you like to say it returns object. In this case, Spring Framework is not able to understand that this particular bin returns this service. And then your application turns to probabilistic thing. If you are likely that Spring is called this method before you actually need this service in the core context, your application starts. If you change something like a GVM version or something, it may turn another way of creating components and then if you return an object over here, you are likely to have been not found exception. So that's why it's really necessary to put ex explicit type over here. And the implementation is true, we're just asking the component from a subcontext. So, the plugin loader base class, as I told, this is just the thing that creates the component container and it do it on, say, in my case, in auto property set method. It's necessary because otherwise we are not able to be ready to return beans from a bin factory methods. And the implementation of plugin loader, as I, showed as I said before, is quite, exactly looks the same as before. The only change is that we no longer iterate over the all known plugins. Instead, we split the, each, we have, the plugin loader instance for each plugin we have over our application, and it does exactly the same it used to be before. The, here goes yet another trick. It's really necessary to initialize this plugin context variable as fast as possible, because while creating the context, it may turn out that we need the bin which we declare over, over here, and then the, the spring will call back to us while running the auto property set method, and if we are not ready, this likely to have a null pointer exception, for example. So that's why you should initialize the field first and then call refresh. You may decide to, to write it slightly other way and then it may not work right, depending on the beans we have inside. And the whole picture of the context in beans looks like this. So now we have the application core context. In there, we have a specific class with this bin factory, which actually loads the plugin and which actually turns the plugin into model by exporting the beans back. And this is like that. So if you have a number of plugins, we have a number of components in the core context to implement this. And as is shown on this picture, so we have a bin factory plugin loader which returns the full bean, which is actually getting implemented within the plugin. And so I sh the, the trick could be to use configuration instead of component annotation on this bin factory to let Spring help you to avoid to standard catch-ups. Catch and as I said, it's really necessary to cache this application container instance as fast as possible to avoid un un uncertain exceptions. And they, are, they can also be probabilistic depending on the 
way how hash coding is implemented in the particular version of Java and the BIN addresses. And now this time to show this in a demo. And I'm gonna show how this plays in a small, tiny application. And we see no unique BIN definition problem. Let's turn back to here. So we have yet another example. It's a little bit changed. So as you see here, I have dedicated classes for loaders as I shown before. So this is a loader for plugin one, which exports the component of type uh, service from plugin one. And the similar, I have the plugin two for, for plugin two. And now the server component is getting smarter. It now depends on those interfaces from plugins. And it calls method test for each, right? And each plugin now have this dedicated method uh, implementation, which just says this is a plugin one test method called. And here we have the information like plugin two called. And now I'm gonna start this one. And we see this output over here. So this example shows you how you can delegate implementation of components into a plugin. And if you have a real big subsystem, this is a way to isolate this subsystem inside this tiny piece of code. And uh, now let's do a trio thing. So since I created this interface within my plugin, let me decide I need a component which, which just uses for some reason. So I'm gonna type component class test, and I'm gonna depend on this one over here. Is it look workable? Well, it is, right? So I depend from component which is declared over here, right? And here goes the problem. Bam, bam. You see? You like such an exception, don't you? Okay, so it tells us that, that this component is implemented in two places and this not good. But as we have implemented this only in one place, right? And here goes the answer to this. So the problem, and if you take a look closer on our application, we see that we have two places actually which do implement this interface. Because one place is the actual implementation within the plugin context, right? And the second one is the one we annotated with a bin annotation within a loader, right? So we have actually two. And the problem is only when we are trying to reach the components uh, which are exported from a plugin within a plugin, right? Otherwise we, are not, we have only one implementation because the plugin context is isolated, right? So the, this one can be fixed quite easily, but we need some tricky code over here. So what we need to do, we need to instruct the Spring context for a plugin to filter out any beans which are originating from the our loader. And this can be done with two small steps. You need to implement this filter. It's quite, it's quite easy. And the second one, you need to implement a bean name aware interface over the plugin loader to, to know the, actually the bean name of our factory. So once you do this, this problem, problem will no longer <coughs> repeat because we will see the internal bin from the plugin and we see external bin from the outside world. So now I think the second thing is that, okay, I created a small application within one project which shows how it works, but in reality we tend to split things. Why, why do we need to split? Because it's better to have the compiler check some access problems for us, for example. If we are not allowed to access from one plugin to the other, let's split them with, uh, within sub-projects or modules in IntelliJ, how we call it, no matter how we call it. And then the compiler is able to fail and say, hey, this is a known thing. And we can, of course, do it with our example. In this case, uh, we're gonna have a layout where we have the API module, we have the core module, and we have a module per plugin. And this is gonna work better and easier and so as we see now, let's see, I'm gonna show in the next demo, I'm gonna show how, we, how I decided to split this example into a number of projects. In my case, it's Gradle projects. And then I show exported components and I show a jar help. So let's turn back to the demo. And I'm gonna open, uh, I guess, this one.
so now I have a number of sub-projects over here, like API, core, main, plugin one and plugin two. As for loading stuff, I have the main, mo I have a main, com main module, which actually, as you see here from Gradle, actually depends from anything. And it, it just runs the same application as it used to be before. So now I'm able to run it again. So we see this same example, but I created a tiny change over here. As you see here, the plugin one now depends from Guava version 21. And plugin two depends from Guava version 14. So I decided to play some real project and say I have some legacy over plugin two and some, some bright new stuff over plugin one. That's why Guava 14 and 21. And in each plugin, I added the following code. I decided to dump the actual version of Guava. I do it this way in Kotlin. So I just take the class from Guava called immutable list. Then I extract the resource and dump the resource path the, from the class path. And if I start it and you see it over here, I see that plugin two sees Guava 21 in my class path. And plugin one sees Guava 21 in my class path. Something wrong. And with such setup, I am no longer able to resolve this. All I can do is to tweak some dependencies and pretend I'm able to replace Guava 14 with Guava 21. For some cases I can, for some cases I cannot. But the problem is cannot be solved. And now we're gonna turn to the next part of our presentation and talk a, talk a little bit about how this can be solved. And it turns out that it's not that complicated. But first of all, let's take a look what the dependency or jar hell actually means. So, of course, our applications tend to depend from, the, say, whole internet of dependencies. I mean, tri transitive dependencies, say, you depend from a library, your library depends from a library, and so on, and so on, and so quite deep. And just say that we have somewhere deep in this dependency graph, we turn out that we depend actually from the same library, in this example called requests, which actually of different versions. And this is a good question. So now you are able to try to delegate this problem to your build tool, like, Maven, Gradle, or whatever you'll use, and say, okay, pretend there is no problem, let my tool be smart enough to f help me. This can be done, and there is some cool things like semantic versioning, where people try to say, okay, we are not going to break compatibility if we check in some, change in some like third digit in the version number, but you never know what you see from here. But in that particular example, you only, what all you can do, you can try uh, which version is good for you, and nothing to be more. And if you turn back and take a look on my example with Guava 14 and 21, so here goes the part of the release node from Guava 21, and as you see here, they removed some methods from Guava 18. And so that might be a problem, because they, of course, in new Guava, they added new versions, new methods, but they removed some older methods. And if you still depend on Guava 14, this is a question to you, whether you are able to update or not. And if you are not able, then you will consider if you are able to update the version which actually depends on Guava, so as you see here. If you are able to say update this full client to some new version to resolve the dependency hell, then you may consider if you need to, up to rewrite your application to, in order to use this fresh version of full client, and so on and so on, and then you end it ending up like rewriting the whole part of your application and retesting anything just to fix the dependency of problem. That's why it's unpredictably slow. You may be lucky to have no problem, or you may stuck in there like for weeks or even more just because you need to update the whole number of dependencies and retest it again. And actually, uh, the thing, can be solved, and there are a number of ways to solve it. There are like monstrous things like OSGI, Jigsaw modules, and other things. But actually, if we take a look to the core, it can be solved by simply class loading. So if we are able, in our example, to load, to, to have a dedicated class loader and class path for each plugin, then we are likely to solve this problem. And the whole thing, the trickiest thing here is that we need to narrow dependency set for a core part because the lower set of dependencies in the core we have, the more flexibility we have to load libraries in the plugins. And each plugin can have its own dependencies, its own dependencies tree, and we no longer need to think, okay, if I use Guava here, Guava version 21, and I need Guava 14 over here, that's okay, that would work. But we are not allowed in this example to have Guava loaded in the core part. 
otherwise we need another hux. So, and to make Spring work with class loading, all you need is to do the only one extra line in our example. So we need to say that, that context dash dot class loader is some, some my class loader which do the trick. That's it, so easy. The only trickiest part here is to fi figure out how we can create this class loader. And once you decided to do class loading in your application, and there is one thing you should know. There are a number of libraries which tend to use the thread dot context class loader to do some reflection stuff inside. And this can be really time consuming to figure out why my application is no longer working. This is not the class loaders to blame. Actually, it may turn out that all you need to set the context class loader before calling that library and then turn it, return it back to the original one after you complete this call. This is so easy, but you need to know beforehand that there is such a thing. And of course, there are a number of libraries which works okay with the multi-class loader applications and you don't need this trick. But if you see something strange out of your application, check context class loaders. This might be a trick. And if we're talking as for class loaders, uh, there are like, of course you can take some sophisticated library to implement class loading for you. But if you're trying to do it like with zero dependencies, like most trivial thing, you have like two ways to go. The first one is a standard in Java, is the parent first class loader. So what class loader does? Class loader has parent class loader to delegate. And the standard behavior is for if we need to load a class, we check parent, parent recursively check parent and so on and so forth. And finally, if there, we have a class over there, we use it. If no, we go lower. And finally, we turn back to the, our initial class loader to load the class if this is a unique class for the whole hierarchy, like a tree hierarchy. And the second trick is to use the child first class loading. So we are able to sort of break or change the, the, the strategy, strategy and to check the our class path first and then delegate to the parent if we have nothing. And let me discuss a little bit about this ways. So the parent first, the standard one, all you can do, you just create the URL class loader from GDK, nothing specific. All you need to pass the parent as your class loader as a parent. So we may say class dot class dot class, class name dot get class, get class loader and pass it in there and it would work. And in this case, as I told, you are not able to rewrite anything that you have in core. So since the class loader delegates to the upper class loader, so finally to the class loader where the core part of application is loaded, we no longer able to replace anything. So if, if the core part depends on say Guava, you are not able to replace Guava. So you are not able to replace Guava in your plugin. But if there are no such dependencies in the core, you're open to use whatever library you like. This is the easiest way. And if you need to be able to replace Guava version, you can do this. You need to do child first loading, so you need to overwrite a number of methods in the Euro class loader, like load class and get resource, and implement another strategy. So it's, if you take a look in the standard implementation, you can see how you can do this. It's not that complicated. And the cost of this, there is nothing for free, and this is an example. Because the cost of this is that you no longer able to use the same library from a core in your part. So say if you're trying to replace Guava, you're able to do this, you're able to use Guava within your plugin, but you're no longer able to return, say, immutable list to the core. Because in the core there is another class loader, and this another class loader understands something else under immutable list. And if you're trying to return a mutable list from your side to top, that's gonna be exception because there is different classes and JVM is not able to, to transform one class from one class, class path to the same name class from the other class path. But if you're able to specify like interfaces for anything you need, you can rewrite dependencies in this way. It's possible. And this now, it's time for the demo. And I finally show how we can coexist with Guava. And we see, so let's see. Let's take a look. I'm gonna have the second example here. Uh, the changes are that I no longer depend from the main module. If you see, the main module no longer depends on the plugins. Instead, I pass the class path for plugins as a parameter for the executable. And the plugin loader is now changed a little bit. So if you see it here, it does, it, it does check the environment variable for a class path for each plugin before loading it. So it's just to simplify the application. And if I run this one now, let's see. So.
So it is able to call both plugins, but if you take a look here, we see that the plugin one finally uses Guava 21, as we expected, and the plugin two finally uses Guava 14, as we expected. So this is the way to have isolation within the serial lines of code. And of course, we're able to call those extensions from outside. And in my example, the core, the core module, as you see here, does not depend on, on the Guava. That's why it's totally okay to use your real class loader without any rewrites inside, in my case. So I use the parent first delegation class loading, and it works this way. Oh, now this is an interesting topic. By the way, any questions at that point? Okay. Uh, so uh, the modules can be optional. So for example, if we are able to split the monolith into parts, we are able to have a dedicate different implementations of modules depending on uh, actually the role this part plays. So for example, if we have backend and frontend the different ways how we bake the same, same monolith application, we're able to replace some implementation details with a say remote library which do the call, for example, this way. And this is a way how we can just adjust the application to needs since we are able to offload the module and we see the dependencies. It can be done quite easily. And a little bit as for layout. So in my example, in my, my application, I decided to follow the following layout. So under web and flip, I create, so that we have a standard lib folder as, as, as we used to. And I created a dedicated folder called modules under which I have each plugin with the, their dependencies and implementation parts. And I, I have these loaders for every plugin in, in the core part in my application to actually load this. And actually, it's time to turn back to the practice. And remember, I showed you this slide about this horrible library with a number of dependencies. And the, the, the idea with modules I showed you, it, it really plays really good for my example. So I was able to update dependencies to this library on and on and on. At the moment, I was like forced to update this because the library was fixing another issues, quite critical. And it turned out to me that I should be able to update this huge library quite fast to solve these problems with compatibilities and stuff from the one hand. From the other hand, I was not likely to waste my time changing the whole application to be able to play good, for example, with uh, Jackson. So I did, my application did depends on Jackson or the other version. And if this Jackson version is changing, I have problems. And I don't want to check whether new or older version of Jackson is so good so to run the whole application. And it worked to me. After some while, uh, the application development turned further. And it started clear to me that I need to experiment with Netty part. So I created yet another module which do play with Netty. At some like weeks after this, we decided to play with a Google gRPC library for another remote and stuff. And it turned out that we easily can create yet another module and load gRPC library inside. But you know, this gRPC library depends on Netty again, some other version, and on Google Gesson, JSON is it yet another Jackson serialization library. And it turned out that there is actually no idea to have thinking about the problems. Like, you can load whatever you like in this setup, and it works. And then you may decide whether you like one module, the other module, where need. So we can concentrate on development, not on the problems. So, and as for summary, uh, so what I showed, so I was trying to s show that it's possible to split monolith to be able to develop faster and to solve the number of problems. So the first step is to split the monolith into plugins or modules. The next step is to make each plugin or module to use its own class path to tackle dependency hell. And the outcome is that you, you have a clear layer API, you see clearly which subsystem, which module, what it consumes from the core, what it exports back to the core. And if you do this, you're able to even consider microservices, so you're able to replace a module, as you see the clearly the API, you can replace it with remote calls, for example. It, it turned to be easier, and you're able to configure this in, say, in your parameters of your application. And the trick is that this, the whole thing is implementable within a number of lines of code, so there is no reason to extract a library for it. You can find out the examples on GitHub, and if you have questions, I'm here to answer. And thank you for your time. <laughs>